Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, has a symbol, and that symbol is a triangle inside of a circle. Triangle is comprised of unity, recovery, and service. And I take my body to the fellowship, and I take it to meetings, and that's the unity we talk about. And after I go to meetings, and I go to meetings, and I go to meetings, and if you take the body, then your mind is going to follow it. And I take my mind and I put it in the recovery and I treat it with the 12 steps. And I take my recovered spirit and I put it into action and service. And that's what I like and that's what I like to see and that's what I've seen this weekend. And those are the people I always like to salute. The speakers who are coming up this weekend, you know, we have a lot of um Somebody, sometimes you probably think this is the meat and potatoes of it. And we're in the spotlight. We're the spotlight people this weekend. But there are other people who make this weekend possible. You know, they're the ones who do it in the dark and outside of the spotlight. They're the ones who do it most of the time, not just at events like this. They get up on Tuesday night, nobody looking, and they go open up the door and they fire up the coffee pot and they wait on Ralph to show up. And I don't care what Sunday night it is. It could be Super Bowl Sunday. It could be their kid's birthday. And they get up out their beds and they go open up the meeting. And they fire up the coffee pot and they wait on Ralph to show up. And they go in our prisons and they go in our institutions and they go in our treatment facilities and they look for Ralph. I call them the shadow soldiers, the ones who operate in the dark when nobody's looking. And if you want your recovery to go to a different place, and most people who come to events like this do, if you wanted to go to another level and take on a different dimension, look at the people who do service. Look at the people who throw themselves into really what the true mission of Alcoholics Anonymous is. 1935, one drunk sat down with another drunk, sat across the kitchen table, and he started doing what is the essence of our program. It's still what we do today, and everything else is just the trappings. One drunk sharing with another, experience, strength, and hope. And the rest of it is the trappings, but basically what we still do to this day, one alcoholic sharing with another and seeing the light come on and people picking up their beds and starting to walk out of here. This weekend, I particularly like weekends like this. It's, um, if you're sitting out there and you're thinking about the time when Jimmy or somebody like Jimmy is going to finally ask you to come up and speak at one of these events, I understand. Um, <laughs> And what it's like is you hear some people get up, and it's a little bit intimidating. You know, my brother came up, and he shared about step one, the first step in recovery, the foundation of recovery. Talked about that doctor's opinion and talked about the physical allergy that I suffer from. Talked about that if I don't know what the problem is, and step one is the problem, if I don't know what the problem is, then there will be no solution for me. And if I don't have a problem, I don't need a solution. So the hopelessness that's embodied in that step, I really appreciate Ronnie sharing about last night. You know, the hopelessness, not just the powerlessness, the hopelessness. You know, because I got to that point. Mari said something about desire being something that comes of its own volition, not something you can wish for, ask for, think about, get talked into. Nobody in here can give it to you, and it has to be something that's earned. I earn mine. How did I earn it? I always like to say it. One thing brings on desire and willingness, well whooped ass. You know, and uh, <laughs> Ronnie shared about that. And I brought that to the table. I was listening to Mickey when he shared. You know, I brought that to the table, and I, and, I, and I could not do it on my own, which propelled me into the solution, step two, a conclusion I also draw based on my experience. And that's step two, and I love, say, I'm in between a couple of people who are some of my favorites, you know, Mari and Bob who come behind me. I kind of think of them as like poet laureates of Alcoholics Anonymous. They don't just share, you know, they sing. And, and when Mari was up here, you know, that lilt and that accent helps you, Mari. You have an advantage. 
you have an advantage some of us don't have. When Mari gets up here with the Scottish Shidish, and then she's got a tinge of the Jamaican in there, too. You know, she's singing at the podium, and she's so eloquent with it, and she, and she laid out that second step. You know, a conclusion I draw based on my experience and talked about the need for not just knowledge of this pop, but relationship with relationship with his power. And the reason I needed a power bigger than me is because I already had a power bigger than me, and that power was king alcohol. I needed a power bigger than it. And once I discovered, and I came to that conclusion, a concession conceded to my innermost self that I was alcoholic, you know, and then I did that negative second step, come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I have been living it. And I come to believe I was just tore up and I was just going to be that way without something coming in and helping me. And so that propelled me into that next one that Mickey talked about so well. And and the way that these people, that they got up here and talked, uh, I'm like you, Mickey. I sit up and I think about the talk I want to give. And then sometimes I don't. You know, we had a brother in my home group. Curiously, his name was Brother. You know, um, <laughs> when we were new, me and Ronnie used to say, this brother's name is Brother? You know, that was, just... <laughs> that was his name. And brother used to say, when heart speaks, heart hears. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, we speak the language of the heart. So I don't really waste a lot of time thinking about what kind of talk it's going to be because when heart speaks, heart hears. And when I was sitting here listening to the people come up here, and from the moment that Mickey came up here and had the tissue and the rest of that, I was like, okay, this is a heart speaker. I'm with this. I like that, you know. And, and talked about that third step decision. And for a guy like me, you know, uh, fourth step, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. Mari in her talk talked about polishing all of the muck, you know, polishing it so there may be a glimmer of sunlight can come through. Because deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of this power. Why a fourth step? What is this whole inventory thing? Where's table 30? Raise your hand, table 30. Where you at? Hey, I'm going to give a shout out to table 30. That's the youngsters in the house, huh? <laughs> I think at table 30, I've been long, sober longer than any of you guys been alive. I want to welcome you. <laughs> I think that's all teenagers over at table 30. You know, that's young guys over at table 30. You know, I'm a guy, and you know, that, and, and, and especially in a gathering like this, you know, one of my mentors, Bob. Here, I just listened to Mickey. He got sober in 1974. Bob, oh, Dick. Another one of my, you know, my guy, spiritual guides, and, you know, and then Mari, who I've been with a lot, and Peter, you know, and I am a let me impress you guy. You know, I am all front, no back, you know. I'm an I'm a image guy. You know, and you put me in this setting right here with these people here who can quote the book. And the well, my temptation is to come up here and quote a lot of page line references, you know, let you know how well I know the book, you know, really say, OK, I'm not going to really talk about nuts, nuts and bolts. And stuff. But I'm going to really get really theoretical and have, and give you what my opinion and my take on this in a whole different way than most folk have. That's that's my inclination. That's the guy I am. You know, and I'm glad we got table 30. Because instead of talking to Bob Darrell and instead of talking to Mickey and instead of talking to Dick Anderson and my brother and Mari, I think I want to talk to table 30. Yeah. Because somebody in here just might want to know about staying sober. See, 25 years removed from the lash of alcoholism, every now and then, I'm tempted to say, my problem ain't drinking. I just want to talk about my everyday living.
October the 10th of 1986, I was not a vision for you. I was in a real dark place. I uh, had had some things and I had accomplished some things in my life. And if you're the alcoholic of my variety, what that means is you just had some things to lose and I had lost them all. In addition to all the material things I had lost, I had lost my self-respect. I had lost the trust in anybody who was close to me. I had lost the will to care about it anymore. And that's the part that scared me more than anything else when I stopped caring about the condition that I was in and where I had descended to. And I was in a real dark place that October in 1986. I was staying in my mom's house because I got put out of my mother's house, out of my, stayed in my mom's house because I got put out of my house. And me and my five brothers ended up over at my mom's house and we damn near killed him. And that October in 1986, I was no longer working and I was no longer employable. I worked in the law department of a major utility company the year before, and they had asked me to leave, and guys like me don't have to get second chances. I hadn't looked at myself full face in a mirror for probably two years, and I couldn't believe what I had become and what I had descended to. Three days after, I found myself in the Harbor Life Center where my younger brother Ron already had been for three months. And I stepped into the Harbor Life Center on October the 13th of 1986, more dead than alive. And I learned some stuff. When desperation meets opportunity, a sliver of grace burns through. And you need to jump through the window when the grace is shining. Because it, 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 the window had opened for me several times. And I wouldn't jump through. And a day or two later, I said, oh, it wasn't that bad. But that October in 86, I jumped through. Jumped through the window when grace was shining. And I went up into the Harbor Life Center on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. Two days after I went in there, they took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got my feet put on a path to really go somewhere. And after I had been doing this deal for a little while, I got interested. I was at a marathon meeting at my home group. I have two home groups at home. At that time, one was 9604 South Figueroa, and the other one was the old Crenshaw Lano Club. And I was at the Crenshaw Lano Club, and I was at a marathon meeting. My brother was there and another buddy of mine. And a group came in. It's interesting because this group was a group that originally came from a guy in Denver, Don Pripps. And this group of people were talking about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in a way I had never seen before at this marathon meeting. You know, and this this group had their members come up, and each one of their members would share about a step, and it caught my interest. I'm the kind of guy that what I get involved in, I get all the way in it. When I was a kid, I collected baseball cards, and I could tell you batting averages. I could tell you statistics. I could tell you who won every World Series dating back into the fifth. I could tell you about it. I could tell you basketball statistics. I could tell you when I get into something, I'm all the way in it. In the life, I subscribe to high times. I would grow plants. I'd hang them upside down. I, when I get in something, I get in it. So when I got into this 12-step program, when I get in something, I want to get in it. And something said to me, why would you be in a 12-step program and not get into the 12 steps? And if you kind of drink where I am and you don't like a lot of ice watering your stuff down, and if you don't like a lot of chase or if you want your stuff uncut, go straight to the book. If you want your recovery uncut, go straight to the book. And some people started sharing that with me. You want your straight no chaser, go to the book. And so some of these people did this at this meeting. And, I, and, and it so fascinated me that my brother and I asked a couple of the members of that group, would they take us and a small group of us through the book the way they had gone through it? And we asked my mom if we could use her house. Now, we had used my mom's house for all manner of other <laughs> illicit, indecent, all kind of other stuff when she was gone. And so in, in November of 1987, uh, at that time, the people who took us through seemed like they were so advanced. Looking back now, a gay white guy from New York and a lesbian black woman from New York 
sat in my mother's house with a group, of, and at that time, both of them had a little over two years sober. Ronnie, my friend Strange, myself, and others of, had about a year sober. And we sat around my mother's dining room table, about 12 of us. And we started going through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, page by page, line by line. And we liked it. It took us about a year to go through chapter 7, the 12, where the 12th step is contained. And we liked it. And we liked it so much, we do what alcoholics do when they like something. They, we did it again. You know. <laughs> and some more people said, we heard about what you're doing at your mom's house. Can we do it? And they came through. And after about four or five years of this, we got too big for my mom's house. And we ended up at one of my home groups. And after a time, we got too big for them. And we'll be meeting again tomorrow morning, that same Never Too Early Big Book workshop that started at my mother's house in November of 1987. We now meet on Sunday mornings, every morning. We've been meeting continuously. And now when we start up, we start up with about 300 members. And every Sunday morning, we average about 220 to 230 people sitting around the room going through the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. Somebody asked me, what happened to your mom? And my mom sends people to us now instead of asking us, when are you coming back to church? She sent us a couple of her deacons and a couple of her ministers, you know, and they come with us. And the reason I talk about that and I'm so passionate about it is I'm passionate about this process of recovery. I'm passionate about the decision I made some many years ago to get on my knees like we all talked about when when Peter in, when Mickey ended his deal. In 1987, I got on my knees with a group of people. And I said, God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will. And that, night, that day in 1987, I was tore up. I wasn't much to look at then, and I didn't have much to offer. Girls, if I walked up to any of you and said, I offer myself to you, you would have said, keep it moving. Dude, <laughs> that's all right. I, I'm good, you know. <laughs> but what impresses me about that prayer that we do in the third step is God don't say that to me. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you're presently doing. I don't care what it looked like. Every church I ever walked into, they used to say, do you accept this or that before you join this church? Are you going to accept these tenets? Are you going to act like this? Are you going to do this? But when I do that third step prayer, I don't care what you're doing. Come crooked. Come sideways. Come still toe up. Come still not. Come still dealing. Come still being just the way you are. You youngsters over there. Well, I got to be already upright to do this deal. Dude, you standing up there in a suit. God don't make too hard of terms with those who seek him. Most free instance in the big book for me. God don't make too hard of terms, and he really don't care what you look like, Ralph. And I came on my knees like that, and I said, do something with me. And that McDonald's franchise that Mickey talked about, that franchise, let me tell you something about the fourth step. If you've been, if you're in here and you've done a third step before and you've ever heard, heard yourself saying, yeah, I turn it over, but I keep taking it back. I turn it over and I take it back. I turn it over and I take it back. What's that about, Ralph? Uh, though that decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless it once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in me that's blocking us. Now, we call that inventory. A strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in me that are blocking me from the sunlight of God's spirit. We call that an inventory. You know, in that second step when Mar when Mar Mari came up here, you know, in the chapter we agnostics it says, you know, um, if I be alcoholic, if when I take one I can't control the amount I take or if when I honestly want to I can't stop when I don't want to take one, then I'm probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you're probably suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer. My problem is I got an illness and my solution is a spiritual experience. If you like me, ooh, that looks scary. It says these are not always easy alternatives to face. Why? Because they look just alike. They're being doomed to die alcoholic death and to live a life on a spiritual basis, what's the difference? You know, why? Well, you know, spiritual death, yeah, I don't like that, but spiritual basis, ooh, I can't stand that either. That's what this deal is about. Roughly half, and I love, Mari, when you came up here and talked about being, a, being one of the ones who had a seeming inability to accept much on faith. So this deal, dudes, this whole deal this whole deal that it is that we do, the whole reason we're here this, this weekend, I suffer from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer. I'm after a spiritual experience, but I don't know what it looked like. 
and I'm handicapped because I think I do. So this whole spiritual experience journey, which is the journey through the rest of these steps, the third step is a promise to submit to the rest of the process. Don't worry about turning my will and my life over my will, which is my thinking, my life, which is my action. Don't worry about turning my will and my life over. The process will do it for me. You just do the actions. You know, the, 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 and, and you've heard all the speakers get up here before me, and they've talked about this disease centering in my thinking, but recovery centers in my feet. Don't try to think your way out of this one. You know, do you a figure out or you a thinker, you an analyzer? That's what you are. You can't think. You know, if you try to apply the solution with the same thing that's the problem, you in big trouble. <laughs> Can't think my way out of this. You know, I have a friend, you know, that says in the big, big, you know, there is no chapter in the book entitled Into Thinking. Into Action. <laughs> Recovery's in my feet. So that third step decision, I actualize it by doing the rest of these steps, four through nine. And when I come out the end of that ninth step, I'm going to see the culmination of that second step. Came to believe that the power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Sanity will return by doing the action. So I start in that fourth step. That whole fourth step, this whole exercise, looking for a spiritual experience. Mickey said, you can't pour God, you can't pour that into a full glass. So I empty myself. Part in the book that talks about, you know, if the alcoholic fails to enlarge and perfect his spiritual life through self-sacrifice and working with a enlarge, bigger, perfect, better. Bigger and better my spiritual life. How I do that through self-sacrifice and working with others. Bigger and better my spiritual life. Grow God, shrink Ralph. Nutshell. Grow God, shrink Ralph. Whole process of recovery designed to get me to that end. Grow God, shrink Ralph. How do I start doing that? First, I start chipping away in that fourth step. Now, the fourth step is, and you know, Bill, uh, he does an analogy and he calls it, does a metaphor, commercial inventory. He says a commercial inventory, any inventory business that doesn't regularly take inventory or go broke. That McDonald's franchise that Mickey was talking about. You know, if I'm being convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success, first requirement for doing inventory. If you run in your McDonald's franchise successfully, the franchise that is called your life, if you run in your franchise successfully, don't do inventory. Don't worry about it. If your life run on your will is successful, don't trip. You can just sit here and audit the course and let the rest of the people listen to this four-step thing. <laughs> so sponsors, when you got people that's balking, don't trip off that. If your life run on your wheel is successful, why would you take a look at it? Keep doing what you're doing. But, but, if you're a train wreck, not only waiting to happen, but repeatedly happening over and over again, <laughs> You just might want to take a look at turning your will and your life over to new management. And that takes more than just a decision. That takes some action. And the first part of that action is looking at it. We call that the, we call that the, that's the uncovering, discovering, and discarding the things in me that are blocking me. And then Bill says, you know, any business that doesn't take regular inventory is, will go broke. Talks about a fact finding and a fact facing. Interesting. Fact finding and fact facing. I had written an inventory when I was in the treatment program. Autobiographical in nature. Many of you might have done those already. And it has some value. I used to really be hard when I first got involved in the book and I'd be like, you got to go to the letter of the law and it ain't no, no. I don't think it's no bad way to look at yourself. Now, I don't know how much value you'll get out of that, but there's no bad way to look at yourself. Looking at yourself, self-examination is just a good enterprise, period. You know, so when I talk about the way that I look at myself in the fourth step, I'm not talking about the way. I'm not a spokesman for Alcoholics Anonymous. What I'm going to present to you is a way, and I'm going to present to you a way that I look at myself. 
And I'm going to present to you a way that I look at myself based on my perception of what it is in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. Because for me, the way that I look at inventory comes directly from what it is that I understand the book says about looking at inventory. You know, so so anyway, I did this autobiographical thing. Now, the downside about doing the autobiographical thing is that allowed me to write down everything I already knew about myself. But the purpose of inventory and the real value I get out of inventory is I discover what I don't know about myself. I discover the things in me that are blocking me. I discover the things in myself that have been holding me back all my life. You know, and why do inventory? You know, when when the reader, and I'm glad that Nick picked the reading he picked. And he talked about being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us. Being convinced that me and the way that I show up was what had defeated me. That's calling for some pretty harsh conclusions on your part, don't you think? Who told you I've been defeated? Uh... I don't think you came up in here because the party was still going, you know. So being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated me. And I'm in on page 52. I couldn't make a living. I was praying to misery and depression. I didn't have a place to stay when I first came in here. When I first encountered inventory, I didn't have a place to stay. I wasn't working. I no longer knew if I was employable. My ex-wife had told me before I got sober that she had taken out an insurance policy, and that was the best thing I had ever done for them, you know, and I and I couldn't dispute it. You know, I didn't have a key anywhere, and I wasn't welcome anywhere. You know, I had no self-respect, and I had no dignity. I no longer was interested in being a father, and I no longer was interested in being a husband. And it wasn't that I wasn't interested in and my experience showed me I couldn't pull it off and so I was in a real 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 bad way so being being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what it defeated us we considered its common manifestations the way that Ralph shows up in his interactions with other folk and when I look at that I'm going to find what it is that I'm looking for I can't remember who talked about it one of the speakers, and it might have been Mari, and it might have been Ronnie, and it might have been Mickey, and it might have been all three. But if you're sitting in here this morning, and you're interested in freedom, and not just relief, if you're really interested in the freedom that this program has to offer, I get on the high road and I get ready to take off on that when I get into the steps and the program of action that's embodied in 3 through 12. And so especially four through nine, especially four through nine. So it's the common manifestations of self. And these ways that Ralph shows up, they, they appear to be so significant. The bill says we're going to look at these three areas. We're going to look at resentment, we're going to look at fear, and we're going to look at his sex conduct. And if we look at those three areas, we look at the things in him that are blocking him from this spirit and the things in him that are blocking him from this power that he so desperately needs. He wants it, but he can't get it. It's blocked. He blocked from it. But grace is always shining. I'm just blocked. It's the receiver that's blocked, not the sender. You know, the receiver's blocked. So these are the things we're going to look at. And the first area we look at is resentment. First area we look at is resentment. And you know why that's so troublesome? Because sometimes resentment seems to work. How many people have read in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, resentment is the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anybody. How many people believe that? I don't mean to offend anybody, but I think we got a lot of suicide bombers in the house right now. <laughs> I have a saying, and I say it to myself more than I say it to anybody else. What you do speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. What you do speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. So sometime, when I'm in the midst of nursing one of those good resentments, and I claim that I know resentments have the power to kill, then why the hell do I nurse one so closely to me and hold it and won't let it go? Because intellectually, I think I know the resentment's out of power to kill. But if you look at the way that I live my life, I don't always believe that. Sometimes I think resentments work for me. Some people just need a good cussing out every now and then, don't they? 
sometimes you just got to keep people in place and in check or won't they run over you? If you let them get away with it this time, what's going to happen the next time? You give them an inch, it's the whole yardstick the next time you look up, right? Many couples we got up in here, people that's in relationships. Sometimes I ain't even mad. I just have to act as if I'm punishing you because I can't let you get away with that one like that. Men, men, I really can't let him walk away from here thinking he got the best of me. You never let them see them punk you. You can't let them punk me. So I got that mentality working. So sometimes I think resentments work for me. Other times, resentment coupled with fear, I think, works for me. If I get free of the resentment, am I not condoning the behavior that brought it on? If Uncle Charlie came in my bedroom when I was six, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, kept doing it. If I let that resentment go, am I not saying what he did was okay? I got to hold on to it. It's the anger that fuels me. It's the anger that protects me. It's the anger that allows me to make sure nothing like that will ever happen again. If you don't take care of you, who will? Sometime. I think resentments work for me. How many times have I heard people say, I stayed sober off of resentment. They told me I wouldn't be the one around here. I'll show them. Sometimes I think just because I claim something is true, that makes it so. I can connect dots wrong a lot of the time. I can, yeah, I might have got pissed off at Bob Darrell for looking at me crazy and saying, I know you're going to drink one day. And yeah, 10 years later, I might say it might be that resentment that kept me sober. But I suspect it was that ass whooping that really is the one that kept me going to meetings. And every now and then I thought about Bob. But I might suspect that it's that working with a sponsor that kept me going. And it's that right and a fourth and a fifth step that kept me. And But since I connect dots wrong, when I stand up and talk to people, I'll say, it was that resentment about, no, no. I had plenty of resentments that my old lady was out when I was in the life. How come you can't make it home with a whole paycheck? Why is she talking to me like that? It never got me sober. I remember the time when I came home off a four-day run, and my mother was in my house. And I walked in the door. Saturday afternoon. And I had a story for my wife at the time. And when I opened the door, my mom was there, my wife was there, a baby, my daughter was there, and a preacher was there. And I looked at my wife, and I didn't say nothing, but I said, I can't believe this be told my mama I'm getting loaded. Like my mother didn't already know, right? And, <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, how could they turn on me like this? Mama, I always made you proud. I was the first one of your boys to go to college. You always, I was bringing, I was a straight A student. I'm thinking way back in all of the times she used to be proud of her boy. How could you give up on your son like this? I'm thinking, I'm looking at my wife and I'm thinking, not saying, how you just going to give up on me like this? And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, when the kid comes back, ain't nobody going to be able to say nothing to me. I don't want you coming up to me. And I'm saying that. That same night, I'm loaded again. Resentments never had the power to hold me, and no human power could. So I got into this deal, this fourth step experience. And the book outlines the way that a resentment inventory is done. First, I said, I'm not going to really talk about resentment inventory. And then as I was at lunch with Jimmy, he told me about my boys over there. You know, and in the book it talks about, Ralph, I'm going to give you some straightforward suggestions about how to do this inventory, 
how to take a look at what it is that really fuels you and what it is that really drives you. Because somebody in here wants to be able to keep going to the family reunions that you've been avoiding for years. Somebody in here might want the freedom to be able to go back over to the family gathering on Christmas that they've been avoiding because Uncle Charlie is going to be there. Somebody in here might want to be able to go back and see and go to the wedding, you know, because they couldn't go because you and your sister ain't talked for years. Somebody in here might be able because, you know, the thing about resentments, yeah, sometimes Barbara was talking about it. She was talking about it in her forgiveness deal. And she was talking about the reason why sometimes people are not able to forgive. Read, hold on to resentments. Unable to forgive, read, justified and holding on to a resentment. And the thing about a justified resentment, it looked just like unjustified resentment. They don't really matter. They don't really matter. They hurt me. Me holding a resentment is like me drinking poison and waiting on you to die. I got another friend that says me having a resentment is like me, because Barbara says one of the reasons why people hold on to them is they're punitive. I got to punish you. The problem with that is me holding a resentment is me holding you in jail, but I got to stand guard. We both up in there. And the thing about resentment, especially when I use them for power or protection, Barbara said, I build a fence to keep you out, but guess what? Keeps me in. Keeps me in. When the book talks about resentments, it talks about we set them on paper. Then we ask ourselves why we have them. So the first thing I do is I look at people, institutions, and principles with whom I'm angry. Most of you have done resentment inventories. I'm going to pretend somebody in here hasn't. And what I do is I list people, institutions, and principles with whom I'm angry. At the beginning, when I had never done an inventory, I focused mostly on people, and I'm focused some on institutions. And I focused a little less on principles, people, institutions, and principles. I looked at my family members. I looked at my schoolmates. I looked at if I had been in the military. I looked at the fellowship. I looked at church. I looked at work uh, relationships. And I looked at broad categories of people, and I went back as far as I could go back. Ralph, how far do you go back? I went back as far as I could go back. Ralph, do you have to look at everybody? And yeah, yeah, I don't censor at the front end. I write everybody's name on a list. Well, what if you don't feel bad at them now? Don't worry about it. I still write their name on the list. I'm just doing the first column. So everybody I think about, I come up with that I had a resentment at, I write them on a list. I don't censor and I don't, and I don't sit up here and edit. I don't edit my list. I write a list. I write a list. Well, how do you start writing on the people? Do you write the most important people first? Or the most, uh, I don't know. You just write. I write. What I do for myself now, because I like to get started, is I don't put my wife and my mom and my brother, I don't put them first. I do what I call some of the easy ones first so I can get the power of getting them done. Because I'll agonize over my wife and I might have so many causes that I just throw my hands up, you know. So then I'll do the easy ones. And then, well, how do I know what I call the easy ones? That takes me to the second column. And in the second column, because I write a four column resentment inventory, we had some handouts we passed out. And I just did it for ease so somebody could refer to it. And the second column is the finger pointing column. It's the easy column. It's the column I live in most of my life, and it's the, cause, it's the cause. What am I mad at you about? Oh, we need to back up a moment. What goes on in resentment inventory? How do I know resentment anyway? Resentment, refill, resense, refill something. Uh, Mickey was talking about a football game when he talked about prey, the misery, and depression. And if you look at a hit in football and you see it, ooh, that was a cold hit. And then if you see it in slow motion, it looked like it was an even bigger hit. Oh, my God. And they show it from another angle, and you say, oh. And that's the same way a resentment does. I walk in the meeting, I see Bob talking, and Bob is talking to, you know, he's talking to Mari, and they stop talking when I come in, I know they were talking about me. <laughs> know they were talking about me. So resentments, real, imagined, potential, resentments. I write them down. Don't worry about whether or not they actually happened to me. They did. You know, and so when I walk out to Bob and Mari, now when I get in my car to go home, then I do the instant replay deal. Not only did Bob and Mari look at each other, but Bob kind of sneered when, he, when they stopped talking. <laughs> and then what the hell Ronnie doing still sitting at the table with him? He's supposed to be my brother. 
Now, he didn't took sides with them, right? <laughs> and then Michael don't even know better. He all the way over here from London, and he taking sides. Everybody at that meeting is full of it. You know, you know all of them. They fakes and alcoholics and all. They phonies at that meeting. I need another home group, and I stop going. And that sounds like an absurd illustration. But there are more people who end up drinking and losing home groups behind something as simple as that. And I cop to it because I'm that petty. I don't want you to know I'm that petty, but I'm that petty. (laughs) And so when I go home and I replay it, it feels even worse. And that's the re-feeling of a resentment. So when we we talk about this deal of resentment, the book says burned up. So look look at words like this. Just look at keywords and buzzwords. Hurt. Mad. Angry, pissed off, you know, the, all those are good words. And another good hint that I have a resentment in somebody is if they lose their name. <laughs> Bob is not Bob, he's that MF, you know. <laughs> Mari's not Mar. oh, that B, you know. When they start losing their name, oh, yeah, it's a resentment. <laughs> Helpful hint over there, you guys. When they lose their name, write them on a list, you know. <laughs> so now I got them on the list. Then what, what am I mad about? The cause. Succinct in that second column. I don't do a whole lot of writing. Don't do a lot of, you can share that with your sponsor or whoever you're sharing it with in the fifth step. Give all the background then. Real fat. Talked about me. Lied on me. And don't do duplicative stuff. He lied on me and he didn't tell me the truth. Same thing. Lied on me. Promised he was going to pay me some money when he saw me at the meeting. He tried to dodge me, and then when I finally ran into it, owes me money. <laughs> Brief, succinct, to the point. Scra- use fragments. You ain't got to use complete sentences. It's yours. You know. And the more succinct I am, the more I'm getting to the heart of what the resentment is. Take the fluff off. Get to the heart of what the resentment is. And if it's more, if I have to use a compound word, if I have to use and or a but, it's probably two resentments. Talked about me and he owes me money. Talked about me. Owes me money. I number them because I'm going to have another column. And that's the third column. And in my third column, I write about each resentment separately. So one person, I can have eight resentments at one person. I have resentment at death. He talked about me. You know, he owes me money. You know, I could have in each one of them, I look at separately in the third column. And in the third column, I ask myself, what part of me was hurt, threatened, or interfered with? Was it my, and, and the definitions I use, if you guys look at the handouts, they aren't Webster's definitions. You know, and I don't make any bones about it. The definitions that I use, because they're helpful and they work, if they help you and they work for you, then use them. The words are straight out of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The definitions I use have been helpful for me. What part of me have hurt, it was hurt, threatened, or interfered with? My self-esteem, how I look at myself. How I look at myself. I have a resentment at my father. What's the resentment? He left us. What did that? Hit, what part of me was hurt, threatened, or interfered with? My self-esteem. If I'm important, you would not leave me. I'm not important. I write what we call an extended third column. I usually write a sentence to help me see why it is that I feel that part of me is hurt, threatened, or interfered with. My pride. Flip side. What I think other people think about me. I didn't think he saw me as important or he wouldn't leave me. He must not love me or he would have stayed. Other people look down on me. So my personal relationships. Any relationship where sex is not involved. Friends, other people, family. My relationship with my old man was hurt, threatened, and interfered. It was hurt. And it was interfered with when he left us. My relationships with everybody else. I come from South Central Los Angeles, and believe it or not, more people rather than less came from a one-parent household. But if you're the kind of alcoholic I am who lives myopically in my own world, I thought I was the only person like that. I thought I was the only kid at the father-son banquet whose big brother was there. I thought I was the only kid at the father-son banquet whose uncle was there or who didn't have anybody there. 
Now, looking back, I know probably half the cats there did. But I felt like I was the only one. Personal relationship. My ambition. What I think, what I want to be okay. And I wanted a whole family. I wanted a nuclear family. I wanted a family like the Cosby family. I wanted a dad like that. I wanted a father-son relationship. My security, what I think I need to be okay. I need a father's love. I need a father's guidance. Sexual relations. How the hell are your sexual relations when you're about a 10-year-old kid get interfered with or hurt or threatened by your dad leaving? Well, when I do inventory, I look at its impact on my whole life. And even though I do inventory from the eyes of a 10-year-old, from an event that happened to a 10-year-old kid, I do inventory from the eyes of today, a 58-year-old man. And when I wrote inventory at the first time I wrote it, I was probably a 30-something-year-old guy, and I did it from those eyes. And my dad leaving me has always left me feeling like the rest of you guys had an answer on this manhood thing I didn't have. And particularly it was true when it came to my interactions with women. I was always scared of girls when I was a kid growing up. And that carried me through in the life. So I bought relationships. And I always felt like, ladies, if you really knew me, you wouldn't find me enough. Tracing it back. Power of inventory power of inventory, not to show me what I know about myself, but to reveal to me what I don't know about myself, my beliefs, my attitudes, my values, what drives me and what fuels me and what motivates me, what drives me that I don't even know is driving me, power of inventory, powerful stuff that we do in these rooms. I loved it that they were talking about this soul sickness that in the book it talks about if you work on the spiritual, the mental, and the physical to straighten out. We are not talking about therapy for our mind in here, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we're talking about power, pathways to power, you know, a doorway to something that I really need for me to live, to live life successfully. I don't know about anybody else. Life is big on a guy named Ralph. It gets too big for me. And me facing it by myself is bigger than I can do, and it's more than I can chew. You know, I, I, so, so this, this power deal, this idea about accessing power through this process that you guys have laid out, you know, I love it. it you know, this fourth step, I embrace it. I invite it, and I look for it. You know, pocketbook, my money, my property. Self-explanatory pocketbook. Of course my pocketbook was affected. My mother was a single mom raising six boys by herself. Of course it was affected when he left, even though he wasn't bringing money in when he was there. Now that I look back on it, I probably shouldn't have that one on my inventory. Her, her pocketbook probably improved with his ass gone. <laughs> Just thought about that one. Sometimes you get epiphanies up here at the park. But, you know... Potentially, my pocketbook should have been, he should have been a guy contributing to bringing up his kids. So, yeah, my pocketbook was hurt, threatened, or interfered with. And so that's how I do it. And then I go to that last column, the freedom column, place I try to live. You know, my part. You know. What was I, selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or afraid? Selfish. You know, and sometimes one of my definitions for selfish is where am I playing God? You know, and I'm selfish because I wanted my old man to be something other than what he was. My old man was a janitor. Even I don't care what my ambition was. My ambition was I wanted a Cosby relationship with my father. Well, Bill Cosby, A, is a fictional character. B, he was a doctor as that fictional character. My dad was a janitor without a high school education. He couldn't have been that way if he had wanted to. My dad is shorter than Ronnie. And the reason I say that is, want my dad to be the Cosby character, I might as well have wanted him to be Michael Jordan. He couldn't. Sometime in inventory, and when I do inventory, and when I go to the fourth column, sometime I want folk to be what they can. What they can. My father no longer, he no more had the ability to be the Cosby dad than he had the ability to be six feet. He was what he was. And I was interested in what I wanted. And so then, and he left us. Well, dishonesty. My father didn't left us. My mother put, a, put him out. And I knew it. 
And I knew it. And for years I walked around with the resentment that he left us. That's the dishonesty. I knew it and walked around. And here's the other cold part of that dishonesty. I was glad when he left. (laughs) And walk around with this resentment about a fictional character. So the truth of the matter is I wanted a different dad to be in my life. Because the dad that was in my life, I was glad when he was gone. Because he was flawed. He was somebody I saw as weak. That's another resentment I had at him. He seemed weak to me. He was. I was embarrassed about him. I was ashamed about him. I didn't want him at the father-son banquet if he would have been there. I couldn't stick my chest out and say, this is my daddy. Wow. Yeah. So I'm selfish because I'm wanting my dad to be something other than what he was. He is what he is. Wow. I play God when I want anybody or anything to be other than what it is. And so I was caught up in that. I'm like, wow, light bulb me. Light bulb me. Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking. Elevated myself at his expense. Every opportunity I got, I talked down to him, then my, to my younger brothers, who didn't even know him as well as I knew him. And I threw salt on him and I poisoned their well about him to make myself look better, I thought. Fear. What was the fear? Fear that I would be like him. Fear that people would look down on me. They knew who my daddy was. Fear that people did look down on us who did know who he was. Fear not measuring up. Fear not being enough. Fear, 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 fear. Fear driven guy. So I started looking at that. Well, Ralph, where is that taking me anyway? Well, And a lot of people say that. When I see the truth about my situation in the fourth step, how come I still feel like I feel? Because this ain't a four-step program. This is a 12-step program. Fourth step is just looking. Fourth step is just looking. But I got to start with looking. Same as the third step is just a decision. But each step builds on the next step. So, yeah, we're not stopping there. But thank God I start seeing the truth about myself. And I start seeing, because the book talks about if you've done this, now you've seen and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. So what about some of the ones that I just can't, you know, I get to resentments and and it just seems as if I don't know why I have them. Or some of them it seems as if I can't get free of them. Yeah, you just talked about your dad and you talked about the fourth step, but I got Uncle Charlie that came in my room when I was seven or eight years old. What's my part in that? How you going to tell me to get free of that resentment? First, I got to want to. First, I got to want to. Tell you something about this program I entered on. I signed up for the duty October 11, 1986, and I signed up for any and everything that's in front of me. You know, in recovery, Recovery. I don't come to these things, and, you, and a lot of people do. If you think this weekend is about the acquisition of knowledge and information, that's okay. That's okay. But what, we, what, what the big book is designed to do and what our experience is designed to do is not so much give out a knowledge and information, but it's to transmit a series of spiritual experiences. It's to transmit shared experiences so that somebody can get a taste of the power, somebody can get a taste of freedom. Somebody can want to get a taste of freedom. You want more than just relief and you want freedom, there's a path. You know, and so I'm hoping and I encourage anybody to do everything that's in front of you because what this program has to offer is a whole lot more than just relief from drinking. And this fourth step is the first step. I mean, this fourth step, so why write? Why look at that? And and, and just a couple of other things, you know, just briefly. Some people say, because now people have computers and people do, you know, do their inventory online and they save it and the rest of that. And some people ask me, Ralph, what do you have to say about, I don't have anything to say about, oh my God. (laughs) Jimmy, you got to have a clock in this room next time. Oh my God. Um. For those who don't know, I'm clearly going over my time. You know, 
you know, and, and, and it didn't feel like it. And, it. and this step, I didn't even get to talk about fear inventory, and I didn't even get to talk about sex inventory. But I just want, you know, I just want to encourage you to let anybody know that's sitting in here right now, if you want better for your life, if you want different for your life, if you want everything that you can be, if you want to free yourself. It ain't, I have a sponsee, and I was at breakfast with her one morning, and she was saying, Ralph, it just seemed like there's more to me than this. It just seems like, and somebody out here probably is feeling the same way. It just seems like it's more to me than this. Don't you agree? I said, hell no. It needs to be less to you than this. That's the problem. It's too much of me already. This problem, this, this idea, this, this ego-reducing deal that it is that we're involved with is so that it grow God, shrink Ralph, and I'm here to let you know. I don't care what it is that's on your tip. I don't care if Uncle Charlie came up in there. Do you want him out there? Okay, he came in your bed when you were eight. Do you want him out your bed now that you're 48? Do you want him out your bed? There's a pathway to this. Let your ego work for you while it's still alive. Okay, uncle, you did it to me then. I'm getting free of you. Being free of the resentment does not mean that I'm, exo- I'm condoning, exonerating, or excusing the behavior that brought it on. Being free of the resentment does not mean I excuse, condone, or exonerate the behavior that brought it on. Being free of the resentment means I'm being free of the resentment, and I'm turning my will and my life over to the care of something that's bigger than me. The book talks about for now that we, look, we are ready to look at things from an entirely new angle. The Old angle, I got to take care of myself. New angle that I did when I got on my knees in step three, I got a new employer and I got a new protector, and he'll take care of it for me. And he and there's everything that I need. I will never be in it because I hold on to a resentment thinking, I got to have this to protect myself from stuff like that ever happening again. Guess what? I'll never be an eight-year-old little girl again. You ain't got to hold on to that to protect yourself from that. Get him out to bed right now. I'm ready to move on with the next part of my life. It talks about we were reborn. That old person, let them die. Let them die. Let them die. You know, move on to the next deal. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If you taste it, if you take what, taste what it's like, just be, sometime, you know, if you're a dog lover in here, you know, anybody in here a dog lover, seem to me like a dog, especially a dog that's owned by a dog lover, has the best life of anything on the planet. A dog is under new management and don't care. He don't do nothing. <laughs> when you feed him, he ready to eat. Let's go walk. He ready to walk. He don't have to make no decision. You want to put clothes on him? Oh, okay. <laughs> You got a Yorkie and you want to put bowls in? Uh, I don't like it, but all right, that's what you want to do. And he just chill and he's fat and he's fed and he doesn't trip and he has no work. Well, God, be under new management. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm Ralph alcohol. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.